I call this meeting of the Senate Homeland Security and Government Affairs Subcommittee on Emerging Threats and Spending Oversight to order. I want to thank Senator Hassan for allowing this bipartisan hearing to occur. Welcome to each of our panelists. Thank you for joining us. The purpose of this hearing by the Subcommittee on Emerging Threats and Spending Oversight is to discuss, as our name implies, the emerging threat posed by gain-of-function research. We will hear from a panel of three witnesses, all of whom are extraordinarily accomplished experts in the scientific community. We're grateful for their work, and we are grateful to each of you for taking the time to appear with us this afternoon. Gain-of-function research is a controversial scientific research method involving the manipulation of pathogens to give them a new aspect or ability, such as making viruses more transmissible or dangerous to humans. Despite all we have learned about the potential risks of this particular method of research, this is the first congressional hearing on this subject since the pandemic began. Today we will discuss what gain-of-function research entails, how gain-of-function research is defined, and whether the definition of gain-of-function research is applied consistently by the Department Health and Human Services P3CO Review Committee. This is a committee that was set up to study potential uh, pandemic pathogens. We will discuss uh, the responsibility for how we determine the risks and benefits. We'll also discuss how this committee operates, how this committee approves or denies projects from receiving federal funding based on whether the pathogen is considered to be a credible source of potential future human pandemic, and if the potential risks as compared to the potential benefits to society are justified. In other words, a project is not gain of function if the review committee is unsure if a recombinant virus will create a future pandemic. There's a question of whether or not there's a reasonable expectation that it might be, or whether or not it has been in the past, or what viruses should be and should not be experimented upon. This broad criteria gives one sole committee, which is comprised of an unknown group of bureaucrats. I believe the names are not released of who's on the committee, so there's, ne there's not necessarily any oversight of the oversight. The power to spend millions of taxpayer dollars on a single preemptive guess with potentially devastating consequences. Today, we will also consider whether gain-of-function research was performed at the Wuhan Institute of Virology. First, no one, not myself or anyone I'm aware of, argues that a recombinant supervirus that has been published in scientific journals is COVID-19 or, or a close relative. If, and I underline if, COVID-19 leaked from the Wuhan lab, it would be a laboratory-created virus that the Wuhan scientists have not yet and are unlikely ever to reveal. I maintain that the techniques that the NIH funded in Wuhan to create enhanced pathogens may have or could have been used to create COVID-19. The American people deserve to know how this pandemic started and to know if the NIH funded research that may have caused this pandemic. Gain-of-function research has the potential to unleash a global pandemic that threatens the lives of millions, yet this is the first time the issue has been discussed in a congressional committee. I'm sure each member of this committee, as well as the full Senate, can agree that we need stronger government oversight of how our tax dollars are being used to finance experimenting with, mute, uh, with possibly fatal diseases. Again, I thank each of our distinguished witnesses and for being, for being here today, and I thank uh, Chairwoman Hassan for working with me to convene this meeting. Before we begin, I would like to uh, note that I've invited senators who are not on the subcommittee to also attend today, therefore I ask unanimous consent to allow Senator Marshall and Senator Johnson to fully participate in the hearing provided that any members of the subcommittee be given deference in the order of recognition. Without objection. Next, I'd like to remind witnesses that any written testimony they have, anything that they have submitted, will be included in the record, and to please keep your opening remarks to around seven minutes. With that, I'm going to introduce the witnesses, and we'll hear their remarks after the introduction, which is slightly different than we do sometimes, and then I'll introduce the, sec the next witness. The first witness will be with us by uh, Zoom or Skype is Dr. Richard Ebright. Dr. Richard Ebright is the Board of Governors Professor of Chemistry and Chemical Biology and the Director of the Waxman Institute of Microbiology at Rutgers University. Dr. Ebright completed his undergraduate degree from Harvard University in Biology, where he earned summa cum laude honors. 
He later received a PhD in microbiology and molecular genetics, also from Harvard. Dr. Ebright's research ha has led to over 175 publications, as well as over 40 issued and pending patents. He has received numerous awards for research and is currently a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, as well as the Institutional Biosafety Committee at Rutgers. He's a fellow of the Infectious Disease Society of America, the American Academy of Microbiology, American Association for Advancement of Science. He was the editor of Molecular Biology for 16 years. Dr. Ebright currently serves as the project leader of three current NIH research grants, provided, has provided testimony to the House Committee on Energy and Commerce on the 2014 anthrax incident, was a founding member of the Cambridge Working Group, whose cautionary statement on gain-of-function research involving potential pandemic pathogens remains as relevant as the day it was released in July 2014. Dr. Ebright. Thank you. Chair Hassan and members of the committee, thank you for inviting me to discuss gain-of-function research and its oversight. I'm Board of Governors Professor of Chemistry and Chemical Biology at Rutgers the State University of New Jersey and Laboratory Director at the Waxman Institute of Microbiology. In my oral statement, I will discuss the definition of gain-of-function research of concern, risks and benefits of the research, U.S. oversight of the research, and steps to strengthen U.S. oversight of the research. What is gain-of-function research of concern? Gain-of-function research of concern is defined as research activities reasonably anticipated to increase a potential pandemic pathogen's transmissibility, pathogenicity, ability to overcome immune response, or ability to overcome a vaccine or drug. Gain-of-function research of concern involves the creation of new health threats, health threats that did not exist previously and that might not come to exist by natural means for tens, hundreds, or thousands of years. Gain-of-function research of concern is a small part of biomedical research. It constitutes less than one-tenth of one percent of biomedical research and less than one percent of virology. However, because gain-of-function research of concern can cause pandemics, this small part is highly consequential and requires effective oversight. What are the risks? Gain-of-function research of concern poses high, potentially existential risks. Gain-of-function research of concern poses material risks by creating new potential pandemic pathogens. If a resulting new potential pandemic pathogen is released into humans, either by accident or deliberately, this can cause a pandemic. Gain-of-function research of concern also poses information risks by providing information on the construction and properties of new potential pandemic pathogens. Publication of the research provides instructions, step-by-step -step recipes that can enable a rogue nation, organization, or individual to construct a new pathogen and cause a pandemic. What are the benefits? Gain-of-function research of concern provides limited benefits. Gain-of-function research of concern can advance scientific understanding, but gain-of-function research of concern has no civilian practical applications. In particular, gain-of-function research of concern is not needed for and does not contribute to the development of vaccines and drugs. Companies develop vaccines and drugs against pathogens that exist and circulate in humans, not against pathogens that do not yet exist and do not circulate in humans. What should oversight entail? Because gain-of-function research of concern poses high, potentially existential risks and provides limited benefits, the risk-benefit ratio for the research almost always is unfavorable and in many cases is extremely unfavorable. Therefore, it is imperative that gain-of-function research of concern be subject to national or international level oversight to ensure before the research is started that risk-benefit ratios are acceptable and risks are mitigated. Effective oversight includes three components. First, research proposals that include gain-of-function research of concern must be identified and flagged. Second, a risk-benefit assessment must be performed. This entails enumerating risks and benefits, weighing risks and benefits, and reaching a decision, either to proceed as proposed or to proceed with additional risk mitigation or not to proceed. Third, Compliance with the decision from the risk-benefit assessment must be mandated, monitored, and enforced. I turn now to U.S. oversight of gain-of-function research of concern. Before 2014, there was no national-level U.S. oversight of gain-of-function research of concern. In 2014 to 2017, 
the government put in place a moratorium on federal funding for, quote, selected gain of function research, end quote, defined as research activities reasonably anticipated to increase the transmissibility or pathogenicity of influenza, SARS, or MERS viruses. The policy was referred to as the PAUSE. Under the pause, 18 projects were paused. However, at least seven of the 18 projects that were paused were allowed to resume almost immediately. More important, other projects that met the definition for coverage, including a project on SARS-related coronaviruses by EcoHealth Alliance and its Wuhan-based partners were not paused due to the failure of the NIH to identify and flag all covered projects. At the end of 2017, the pause was lifted and was replaced by an HHS policy that requires risk benefit assessment before awarding HHS funding for, quote, research involving enhanced potential pandemic pathogens, end quote, defined as research activities reasonably anticipated to increase the transmissibility or pathogenicity of a potential pandemic pathogen. The policy is referred to as the P3CO framework. Under the P3CO framework, cover projects must be identified and flagged by the funding agency, the NIH, and cover projects must be reviewed by an HHS secretary level committee, the P3CO committee. The P3CO framework assesses the reasonably anticipated results of the proposed research. The reasonably anticipated standard employed in the policy is equivalent in all respects to the reasonable person standard employed in U.S. administrative law and U.S. civil law. In principle, the P3CO framework ensures risk-benefit assessment of gain-of-function research of concern. However, in practice, the P3CO framework has existed primarily on paper. In the four and a half years since the policy was announced, only three projects have been reviewed. Most cover projects, including the project by EcoHealth Alliance and its Wuhan partners, were not reviewed due to a failure by the NIH to identify and flag covered projects. In addition, the P3CO committee has been non-transparent and unaccountable. The names and agency affiliations of its members have not been disclosed, its proceedings have not been disclosed, and even its decisions have not been disclosed. Current U.S. oversight of gain-of-function research of concern thus has serious shortcomings. Moving forward, any effective system of U.S. oversight of gain-of-function research of concern must address these shortcomings. My recommendations are as follows. First, Responsibility for U.S. oversight of -of gain-of-function research of concern should be assigned to a single independent federal agency that does not perform research and does not fund research. Second, U.S. oversight of -of gain-of-function research of concern should cover all U.S. and U.S.-funded research, irrespective of funding source, classification status, and research location. Third, U.S. oversight of -of gain-of-function research of concern should be codified in regulations with force of law and should be mandated, monitored, and enforced. And fourth, U.S. oversight of -of gain-of-function research of concern should be transparent and accountable. Thank you for your attention, and I would be pleased to address questions. Thank you, Dr. Ebright. Next, we'll have Dr. Stephen Quay. Dr. Stephen Quay is the founder and chairman of the Seattle-based Atosa Therapeutics. Atosa Therapeutics is a clinical stage biopharmaceutical company that develops novel therapeutics and delivery methods for breast cancer and other breast conditions with the goal of preventing the two million yearly breast cancer cases worldwide. Earlier in his career, Dr. Quaid received his MD and PhD from the University of Michigan, trained as a postdoctoral fellow at MIT, and served on the faculty of Stanford University School of Medicine. Dr. Quaid published contributions to the world of medicine Uh, have been cited extensively, and he is a medical entrepreneur. He has founded six startups, invented seven FDA-approved pharmaceuticals, and is the holder of 87 patents and over 130 pending U.S. and foreign patent applications. He's also an author. Notably, during the pandemic, Dr. Quay published his number one Amazon bestseller, Stay Safe, A Physician's Guide to Survive Coronavirus. Finally, Dr. Quay recently presented testimony to lawmakers as a part of an export forum convened by the House Select Committee on Coronavirus titled, Led by Science, the COVID-19 Origin Story. Dr. Quay? Very good. I offer six statements in opium. One, 
There is no dispositive evidence the pandemic began as a spillover of a natural virus in a market. All evidence is consistent with a laboratory acquired infection. I do understand this conclusion is not widely held. And I could spend an entire hearing painstakingly going through the scientific evidence for this conclusion, but that's not the purpose of today's meeting. I'm happy to discuss the evidence contained in my written remarks during questioning. I'm also willing to publicly debate any virologist on this question at any time or place. Only one infectious disease doctor was willing to debate this question with me last year in a formal debate format, and he lost. I'm also willing to testify under oath if requested. Number two, all evidence is consistent with an accidental and not a deliberate release. Number three, SARS-2 has features consistent with synthetic biology gain-of-function research. Two features involve acceptable academic gain-of-function research, the receptor binding domain optimization and the furin cleavage site. These two features have never been found in nature in related viruses that could have reasonably started the pandemic because of the closeness of these viruses to Wuhan. These two features are, on the other hand, routinely engineered into viruses. In 2018, US and WID scientists proposed inserting, quote, human-specific furin cleavage sites in a bat virus backbone. Two years later, SARS-2 appeared on the WIV doorstep. SARS-2 is a bat-derived virus with a human-specific furin cleavage site. One region of SARS-2 called ORF-8 has features of forbidden gain-of-function research, asymptomatic transmission, and immune system evasion. The WIV was engineering a protein uh, related to ORF-8 to have these two forbidden properties before 2019, as shown in two master's degree theses available only in Chinese. COVID exhibits 40% asymptomatic transmission unheard of for a new respiratory virus. Patients infected with an acquired deletion of ORF-8 have a milder infection. Could the reduced efficacy of vaccines and natural immunity be an engineered feature? It appears likely. Six. In December 2019, the Wuhan Institute of Virology was conducting synthetic biology research on the Nipah virus, which is 60% lethal in low containment BLSA 2-3 facilities. The Nipah virus was in an infectious clone format. Nipah is a BLSA 4-level pathogen and a CDC-designated bioterrorism ter agent. This is the most dangerous gain-of-function research I have ever encountered. We should assume this research continues to this day at the WIV. I'll close with five recommendations for future gain-of-function research. Where did the pandemic begin? The competing hypotheses are a natural spillover at the Hunan Seafood Market in Wuhan and a laboratory-acquired infection. Two recent papers purport to claim the pandemic began at the Hunan market in December 2019. There are at least six serious problems with these papers. The most important are that in the early, uh, in, in the early months, no animal has ever been found to be infected with COVID-19 anywhere, including the market, and the molecular clock of SARS-2 places the first human infection in the fall of 2019, long before the December market cases. And all infections in the, in the, in the market in humans were what's called lineage B and not the most ancestral lineage, lineage A. I, like many other scientists, believe the market cases were a super spreader event. Uh, this first chart uh, here. The earliest cluster of hospitalized patients with both the lineage A and B virus was at the People's Liberation Army Hospital in Wuhan. This hospital is about six kilometers from the WIV and on line two of the Wuhan subway system, as shown in this chart. All early cases are in hospitals adjacent to line two, and the probability this was a chance occurrence is one in 68,000. The line two COVID conduit, as I called it, includes the PLA hospital, the WIV, the market, and the international airport. <clears throat> you can literally walk down into the subway system from the WIV in China and next exit outside in London, Paris, Dubai, Los Angeles, or New York, all before having any symptoms. Modeling by others suggests that the pandemic could not have occurred without the international spreading impact of Line 2. Has gain of function research been useful uh, to the COVID response or any other public health infectious disease emergency? I have found no evidence that gain-of-function research helped in either the COVID pandemic or other smaller epidemics. We now know that an MRI vaccine can be designed within literally days of a new outbreak once the pathogen is sequenced, and large-scale manufacturing can begin soon thereafter. This capability has now been fully road-tested and provides, in my opinion, 
the best defensive capability against future microbes. It's also important to point out that gain of function research is a tiny sliver of all research funded by NIH. Specifically, there were over 36,000 R01 grants funded by NIH in 2020, the latest year with statistics. Of these, the self-described gain of function on potential path pathogens research grants numbered only 21 in the latest funding year. Even expanding this t by tenfold with a less stringent definition of gain of function would mean we are talking about less than 1% of all NIH research funding. I can Im cannot imagine a scenario where but for this tiny research effort, a new pandemic occurs. What reforms should be considered in order to assure that such research is conducted in a safe and transparent manner? While I found no actual benefit of gain of function research, I believe efforts to ban it, given the vested interests of literally the entire virology community, is a hill too steep to climb. A proposal that I believe is achievable is the placement of all select agent research within the existing institutional re re review board structure used for human clinical trials. I believe that this effort would put guardrails around the most dangerous aspects of this research and has the added benefit of international acceptance, including in China. My second reform would be to separate government oversight from the funding agency, um, and the model would be the Atomic Energy Commission. Third suggestion is to place Western biotechnology equipment under export controls and monitoring. There are ways to build into these systems a forensic and law enforcement capability that could, for example, with probable cause and a court issued search warrant, allow the work of any lab in the world to be scrutinized remotely. My fourth recommendation is simple. Don't put dangerous infectious disease laboratories near subways like Line 2, where every major city in the world is accessible within the incubation period of, of, of an infection. Uh, 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 finally, uh, including what I call going of opportunity research, going into caves where humans are seldom found, taking a bat fecal sample containing thousands of viruses, bringing those viruses back to a laboratory and culturing the specimens where a virus might be controlled in a diverse natural environment, is now able to grow unrestricted in pure culture, provides an immense increased potential risk, a gain of opportunity for the virus. This is the goal of the Global Virome Project, a Gates Foundation-funded EcoHealth Alliance-associated effort. Their stated goal, collect the estimated 500,000 unknown viruses that are capable of infecting humans and bring them back to a laboratory near you. What could go wrong? Could I have the last slide here? What happens if we have these hearings and nothing happens? In December 2019, we, we performed a remote audit, forensic examination of the Wuhan Institute of Virology and found synthetic biology experiments with the Nipah virus. At the, as the chart shows, they had created a cloning vector with a virus the US CD, CDC defines as bioterrorism agent. Nipah virus is one of the deadliest on the planet with a greater than 60% lethality. Why were they conducting this experiment? I do not know. But a laboratory acquired infection with this virus, if it became airborne, would make COVID-19 look like a walk in the park. The work of this committee is critical to protecting the American people as well as the people of all countries from future pandemics, man-made or natural. If we now fail to act with the knowledge we have, history will judge us poorly. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. Thank you, Dr. Quay. Our final witness is Dr. Kevin Esfeld. He's currently an assistant professor at the MIT Media Lab Group, where he leads the Sculpting Evolution Group. Dr. Esfeld received his P BA in Chemistry and Biology from Harvey Mudd College and would later complete his PhD in Biochemistry at Harvard University as a Hertz Fellow. While working in the laboratory of David Liu at Harvard University, Dr. Esfeld invented phage-assisted continuous evolution, or PACE, which is a synthetic microbial ecosystem for rapidly evolving biomolecules. Later, during his time as a WIS technology fellow, uh, Esfeld's focus centered around the development of gene drive technology. Many of Esfeld's contributions related to the bioethics and biosafety of such gene drivers, and he is credited as the first to describe how CRISPR gene drives could be used to alter the traits of wild populations in an evolutionary stable manner. In his recent work at the Sculpting Evolution Group, Dr. Esfeld and his colleagues invented the new technology known as daisy drives, which would let communities aiming to prevent disease alter wild organisms in local ecosystems. Throughout his career, Dr. Esfeld has been a champion of universal safeguards, transparency, raising scientific awareness of developing early warning systems to reliably detect any catastrophic biological threat, and advising policymakers on how to best mitigate global catastrophic bio-risk. Dr. Esfeld. Chair Austin, Ranking Member Paul, Senators, thank you for the kind invitation. Now, I have to say that I have no special insights regarding the origins of COVID. 
In fact, I kind of doubt there's sufficient evidence to be conclusive in one way or the other. But our model suggests that knowing where it came from wouldn't actually help us defend against future pandemics. I agreed to speak to a bipartisan hearing today because this is the Emerging Threats Subcommittee, and I'm increasingly concerned by our continuing failure to recognize an increasingly dire technological threat. Leo Szilard, who invented the nuclear chain reaction and launched the modern nonproliferation movement, is a scientific hero of mine. And he wrote, the most important step in getting a job done is the recognition of the problem. The problem isn't our inability to agree on what does or does not constitute gain of function research, or even whether the putative benefits of this research outweigh the risks of accidents. Rather, the problem is that we are so used to thinking of pandemics as a health and safety issue that we've missed the national security implications of identifying viruses that could be deliberately unleashed to kill millions of people. Let me illustrate. When the genome of SARS-2 was first posted online, scientists didn't have to wait for physical samples of the virus to become available to begin studying it and working on countermeasures. That's because we could order synthetic DNA corresponding to the genome of the pathogen and assemble infectious samples using freely available step-by-step -step protocols. From a biomedical perspective, that is a triumph, particularly because it only costs a few thousand dollars and the price is plummeting. But from a security perspective, that means that thousands of researchers could gain access to a novel pandemic agent as soon as it was identified as such. Thankfully, we still don't know of any particularly concerning examples, that is, agents that would likely cause a pandemic if they were to be released, even at multiple sites. If we did know, then the modern day equivalent of a terrorist like Si Chi Endo, who is a graduate trained virologist and doomsday cultist who sought samples of Ebola and used chemical weapons to commit mass murder, might have well assembled them and released them in airports by now. But if you work in public health and infectious disease, you naturally want to know what the next threat might be so that you can better prepare defenses. That makes sense. And that is why both USAID and NIH have funded research attempting to find or create novel pandemic capable viruses in labs all over the world. Now, we disagree on whether some of those experiments might fall into an arbitrarily defined category called gain-of-function research. We biologists disagree over what a species is. Did you know that a tiger and a lion can interbreed? But what nobody disputes is that in the hope of preventing natural pandemics, both agencies seek to identify viruses that could kill as many people as a nuclear weapon to alert the entire world to what they find, and to publicly sharing the complete genome sequences of those viruses so that skilled scientists everywhere will be able to make infectious samples. The tragedy is that these are health experts, well-meaning health experts who have dedicated their lives to fighting infectious disease. And they struggle to imagine anyone evil enough to deliberately cause one. So they never considered that these advances in technology, which are continuing, plus a list of pandemic-capable viruses, would allow a single skilled terrorist to unleash more pandemics at once than would naturally occur in a century. And no one warned them, perhaps because, as has been previously noted, they lack independent security oversight of their work. Now, it's always possible that we could save more lives by helping to prevent natural pandemics than we would lose due to deliberate acts of terrorism. But according to our numerical cost-benefit model, it's not even close, even for the best case scenario. The reason is there's so many viruses in nature, most of which will never encounter a human. The lowest published estimate suggests that for every pandemic virus that does spill over in a century, there's a hundred 
that will never encounter a human. That means if you identify one at random, even if we could perfectly prevent it from spilling over and causing a pandemic, that one virus, then we have a one in a hundred chance of actually preventing a pandemic. But if there's just a 1% chance of deliberate misuse per year, then in that same time period, we can expect to cause a pandemic. In other words, pandemic virus identification, whether it's created in the lab or whether it's just identified in the wild, is expected to kill 100 times as many people as it would save. For 75 years, the United States successfully kept nuclear weapons out of the hands of terrorists. In the wake of a pandemic that has killed more people than could any thermonuclear explosion, it's time to start doing the same for pandemic viruses. For starters, Congress could study, an issue, study the issue and release a finding on whether pandemic virus identification endangers national security. It's just that simple. Then, if necessary, reform USAID and NIH research. It could require an oversight committee of experts from security agencies to review all requests for proposals in the life sciences. It could update the federal select agent program to automatically regulate viruses at the first sign of pandemic capability, because these are the most dangerous agents out there. It could require all DNA synthesis orders to be screened for hazards. And perhaps most important, Congress could legislate catastrophe liability. That is, liability for human-caused events that result in more than a million American casualties, as SARS-2 has, and require general liability insurance to cover it. That would induce the market to price in the cost of negative externalities and cause professional insurance risk analysts to perform those cost-benefit analyses. Now, I'm optimistic about this issue because we just need to buy time. If we can keep pandemic-capable viruses out of the hands of terrorists for a decade, then we can deploy new general-purpose defensive technologies. These range from ubiquitous sequencing that can detect any emerging threat, to perfect protective equipment for our essential workers, to low-wavelength germicidal lights. And these together could protect us from all pandemics, whether natural, accidental, or deliberate. Pandemic proliferation is a solvable national security problem, but only if we recognize it as one. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Esfeld. We'll start with uh, Senator Scott from Florida. All right. Thank you, Chair. Dr. Isfeld, in your testimony, you talk about USAID funding gain-of-function experiments through Deep VZN, VZN, the program which specifically conducts experiments geared toward pandemics in virology and stop, stop spillover, which, as you know, research is spillover between animals and humans. Can you talk about what these programs specifically are and why they may be dangerous? Deep Vision and Stop Spillover are extensions of USAID's long-running PREDICT program, the goal of which was to predict pandemics, that is, to identify viruses in the wild that had a good chance of spilling over and causing a pandemic in humans. And this has, this is part of the laudable One Health program, which seeks to identify essentially hotspots where viruses are likely to spill over into humans and cause a pandemic. Idea is if we find these hotspots, educate the community, teach them what to do in the event of an outbreak, then we might be able to stop it before it reaches our shores. That makes sense. But again, they don't seem to have thought of the security issues associated with publishing a list of pandemic-capable viruses by threat order. Now, we can't necessarily know whether a given pandemic would take off until it's spreading in humans. But there's a narrow set of laboratory experiments that can tell us, does it look like a human endemic virus in certain traits? And these are a tiny subset of all experiments that really aren't very useful for anything else. They don't help with therapeutic development. So part of PREDICT was to take samples of these viruses, bring them back to the lab, run these kinds of experiments, sequence the genomes, share them. They didn't find anything particularly scary, but they found some candidates that looked fairly nasty, including at the Wuhan Institute of Virology. And it's hard to know what USAID did and did not approve, but they are listed as an acknowledgment, as is NIH, on a paper that recombined those dangerous looking but definitely not pandemic capable viruses, and then performed experiments to see did they look like they could plausibly cause pandemics. So do you think these programs are dangerous? I think any program 
attempting to identify an agent that would be widely accessible and could be deliberately released to kill millions of people is pretty much the definition of dangerous, yes. Good. Do you think that USAID, whose main job is to provide humanitarian aid globally, has the oversight for programs and experiments like STOP, Spillover, and DEEP, BZN, which are not humanitarian in nature? I think there's a very strong humanitarian case for preventing pandemics. I think that the absence of security oversight means that USAID was probably just not aware of the security consequences of their work. And it remains to be seen whether they will decide that it is inadvisable to maintain a ranked order list of the most threatening viruses. So do you, do you think they have the oversight ability to, to handle this job? It's unclear exactly who they're seeking advice from. Uh, my understanding is that they are seeking advice from folks with greater security expertise. And the real question is what actions are going to come of that? So would these programs go through a P3CO review? My understanding is that federally funded research does go through P3CO review. However, it is unclear whether the basic find the pathogens program would go through such review because until you find it and at least run some characterization to determine whether or not it looks like a pandemic virus, it would not necessarily be regulated. And as previously mentioned, due to the transparency issues with that committee, it's very much unclear what their remit is and is not. Okay. Are, um, do you know who's on the panel for P3 three COs? I do not. Why, why wouldn't, is it not public? My understanding is it is, is it is not public. Why wouldn't it be public? That is an excellent question. <laughs> so you, do any of the witnesses know why it wouldn't be public? No. Is it part of the- I know it isn't public and I don't know why it is not. So it's part of our federal government, right? Correct. And so what, what, do they think Americans are not smart enough to understand it? You'll have to ask the people at NIH. Do you know how they made the decision not to make it, the names public? I no. Don't. Okay. So for each of you, do you think